everyone, welcome to Politics Today, live on Channels Television. We're live for you from Abuja City in the nation's capital, Abuja. I'm Sean Wakimbale. Welcome on board, everyone. It's a well-packed show for you. So there are a lot of uh, things for us to unpack so you can get a sense of what is happening. We're we'll bringing the biggest stories for you in the land. Let's begin by giving you a teaser of what you might have seen, of those of you who watched it earlier in the day, is that exclusive interview where the Senate Minority Leader and Senator representing Abia South in the National Assembly, Senator Enyanaya Abaribe, who has been speaking about the 2023 presidency and the prospects for the Southeast region. Here's an excerpt of the exclusive interview we had with him. Take a listen to him. Mopping conversations as a possible candidate for your party in 2023. Should that lot fall on you, what would you do? I would if it falls on me. Within six months, all these things would be a thing of the past. Have you ever considered being the president of Nigeria? <laughs> it, it's, uh, I will say this. If you ask uh, governor, former governor Muazu of uh, Bauchi State, we had a conversation of this nature in the year 2000, and he asked me what he said, wouldn't you like to be president of Nigeria? And I said, of course, who would not like to head this beautiful country? In, that was far back as uh, 2000. But, Is your answer still uh, the same? Let, let's put it this way, Chung. My good friend and brother, Peter Obi, said something when this type of question came out. And says, if you have a vehicle with a knocked engine, who would you look for? Will you look for a very good driver? for a vehicle without, with that, that the engine will not move. What you should do first is to go look for a mechanic. Is that not so? A, a good mechanic to make sure that the engine can run. I think we are at the point today in Nigeria where we need that type of mechanic. And it could have been. <laughs> could be. I'm, I'm sure Nigerians will be able to make up their mind who it can be. Oh, do you think you are the kind of mechanic in court <laughs> that Nigeria needs? Why not? The people who are there today, show I don't think that they are much better than me. Well, for more on that exclusive interview with the Senate Minority Leader, Senator Enyanaya Abaribe, Watch Political Paradigm tonight at 11 p.m. right here on China's television. He answered questions on IPOB, the sit-at-home order, the situation in the PDP, and what went down when they debated the PIB and Electoral Act Amendment in the National Assembly. It's 11 p.m. tonight. Before we get into the major issues of tonight, majorly about um, political security, how security is affecting politics and the livelihoods of the people of the Southeast region. It does look like the Anambra governorship election is under severe threat. What will happen? First, my guests are already ready for you. Let's check out some of your political roundup stories. The former Senate President and People's Democratic Party leader in Kwara State, Senator Bukola Saraki, has said that existing unity and peace in the opposition party in the state would ensure its victory in the next general election. Speaking with journalists in Ilori after the PDP Local Government Congress and membership e-registration exercise at his ward in the Ilori West LGA of Kwara State, Senator Saraki said that PDP is the only political party that is united and peaceful in the state. If you look at the years of PDP, 
We are the more united country. We are the more prosperous country. We are the country of focus. And I think that definitely people have seen that it is the party to be in. The former governor of Nasarawa State and senator representing the southern zone of the state, Tanko Almakura, has formally declared his intention to join the race for the All Progressives Congress national chairman. He made the declaration during a political rally in his local government area, Lafia, today. I feel this is the right place and the right time to declare that I, Umar Tanko Almakura, wish to contest for the office of the national chairman of all progressive Congress. So let's get to it, everyone. Let's begin from Enugu State. I take you there where the Southeast governors are not happy with what is happening in their region and they appear to have taken a very bold move on the solutions. And what are those? The Southeast governors have condemned the killings in the Southeast, as well as a weekly sit-at-home order by the members of the indigenous people of Biafra, IPOP. According to the chairman of the forum and the Ebony State Governor, Dev Umahi, the leaders will do all they can to ensure that the order will not hold again and that citizens are able to move freely. They also agreed to domesticate Ebobago in the region before the end of the 2021. Ebobago is the security outfit that is being touted by the governors of the region. They get full backing to security agencies in the region, amongst others. Governors of um, Eboye, Enugu, Imo State were present at that meeting. Take a listen to the governor of Eboye State, Dev Umayi, who spoke on behalf of the governor after their meeting. The meeting received the committee report on various matters affecting the Southeast, especially on the issue of security and marginalization of the Southeast people, and resolved to study the reports from the Ohaneze worldwide for immediate implementation and engagement with the federal government for amicable settlement of all issues agitating the minds of our people, especially the youths. All right, you heard him there. Just, just a snippet of what he said. There's still a lot more. There's another perspective to all of this conversation, and it's what happened. Let me take you from Enugu to Abuja. Now, the Independent National Electoral Commission, INEC, has convened an emergency meeting of the Interagency Consultative Committee on Election Security owing to fresh security concerns ahead of the November governorship election in an Amber State. We're addressing the committee in Abuja, the INEC chairman, Professor Mahmoud Yakubo, disclosed that recent reports from an Amber State show that the goal of those behind the increasing security threat in the state is to ensure that the election does not hold. Take a listen to the INEC chairman. From the reports we have received, the stated goal of many of the attackers is that the governorship election scheduled for the 6th of November 2021 must not hold. This is worrisome for the Commission. We are deeply concerned that specific electoral facilities and materials could once more become targets of attack. The Commission is particularly concerned about the safety of voters on election day, as well as the safety of election duty staff, including security officials who have become the targets of these attacks as well. The thousands of young Nigerians that we intend to deploy for the election, most of them National Youth Service Corps members and university students, need to be reassured of their personal safety. It is in the light of these recent and seemingly escalating threats that the election, um, that the Commission has convened this emergency meeting. We will continue to work with the security agencies and in consultation with respected opinion leaders in Anambra State and the National Peace Committee to ensure that these hit and run attacks do not derail the electoral process. We are confident that at the end of this meeting, 
will bring up specific measures necessary to further guarantee the safety of all persons involved in the election, from voters, election officials, observers, media organizations, and the security of election materials. So there you go, Professor Mahmoud Yakub, the INEC chairman. So, ladies and gentlemen, wherever you may be watching, there are two major issues on our hands tonight. It's about the security in the Southeast, about a number of governorship elections and the threat. The security situation in the Southeast, which is given the governors there a sleepless night, and even citizens are worried about what is happening. So those two issues will unpack. Well, on the program, I try as much as possible with a team right here to help you make a sense of what is happening, give you a global view of everything so that you can make informed decisions as a citizen. And that we're going to do again tonight. So I have my panel tonight to dissect the ramifications and the implications of all of these for you tonight. I have the political, the security, and the legal angles tonight. Those two areas will give you a sense of what is happening. I have joining me a senior constitutional lawyer right here in Nigeria and rights activist, Mr. Clement Nwankwo. Thank you so much, Mr. Nwankwo, for joining us tonight. Thank you, Shun. Senator Chukuka Utazi is a federal lawmaker representing Enugu State in the National Assembly. Thank you so much, Senator, for coming tonight. It's my pleasure to be here. And from the again. United States, is a former director at the Department of State Security Service, DSS, Mr. Dennis Amakari. He joins us from the U.S. Thank you so much, Mr. Amakari, for your time tonight is a serious issue. And lawyers will tell you that the security of lives and uh, citizens is paramount, enshrined in the Constitution, one of the major roles of government. But what is happening in the South East? Let's get talking. Uh, first and foremost, I think we should begin with the situation in the South East. Then we now look at the implication on the Anambra governorship election. First and foremost, let, let's ask the politician, what is happening? Do you understand? the recent state of violence in the region? Well, uh, she, we have had handled an issue of this, of this nature a couple of months ago, discussing about the security situation in the Southeast. You know, there are a lot of things that uh, are rolled into one, you know, that has given rise to the problem of insecurity in the Southeast and disaffection by the people of the Southeast. So these challenges of uh, marginalization, not being, uh, not being allowed to participate to the extent that the Southeast want to uh, uh, participate in the uh, uh, country's uh, the, uh, uh, run of the, uh, this country, is not, is, 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 uh, something that is troublesome and worrisome to the Southeasterners. Nigeria started on a tripod. It does appear you now is a bipod. It is north and maybe southwest and then south-south. The east is no longer there. And if you look into, into the, uh, the history of Nigeria with the way things started, the eastern has played very major role in the activities in everything in this country. All of a sudden, things have taken a nose dive. And people are not uh, happy about that. Uh, that is one, uh, one aspect of it. Then the other issue of, you know, government presence, patronage. You know, our people are complaining that nobody patronizes us. And the worst of the, the whole thing is, when Mr. President wants to talk, address the country and talk about it, he talks down on the Igbos. And that makes, makes everybody, uh, people, uh, our people, to feel bad about that. Senator? So, is As a politician, do you feel marginalized? Yes, I feel marginalized. In what sense? In the sense that the, that, uh, uh, the things that are happening in this country, we are not, no longer there. Look at the you are discussing about this, uh, this is a, a, a multicultural uh, a, 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 a nation with people from diverse backgrounds. Today, how many people, uh, we are talking about security architecture of this country. You call meetings, how to discuss about the security, which is a major issue in the Southeast. There's no Southeast center there to come sit down and ask, tell you the way things are. Is it the reason why the attacks we've seen on DSS office, FRSC office, INEC office, is it the reason why those people are attacking? 
Well, I want to tell you that you are dealing with the symptoms. So there are a lot of issues. When you come back, when you come and want to look at the, this without looking at the cause, then you, you have, uh, you, you, you can get, your, your guess can be good as mine. You know, so, but I want to tell you that people are not happy. Because as a representative of the people yes. in the National Assembly, yes. I guess you're speaking on behalf of your people. Well, and are you speaking their minds? I'm, yeah. te I'm telling you that people are not happy. A majority of our people are not happy with the way things are going. That's just the truth. We are not patronized. We are not just uh, 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 being involved in certain things that are, that are happening in the country in terms of uh, government presence, in terms of uh, 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 projects. Today, go to the Southeast. You can't go anywhere. To move from Onicha to Enugu takes you six hours. It never happened before. You, from Enugu the to roads are bad? Is that what yes, you roads are terribly bad. No, no, not, nobody is fixing any road uh, in our area. But the government said the government is working on the... On I'm, the... I'm not telling you what government is saying. Or what's, I'm telling you as, as, as I'm talking here now. You're saying government is not doing enough. It's not doing enough. I want to tell you, give you a case in point. I'm the chairman of the Committee on Primary Health and Communicable Diseases. And the, the, the primary health care, working in concert with uh, the Minister of Health, have been going part of all parts of the geopolitical zones, you know, talking about this uh, vaccine hesitancy among the populace, you know, and, uh, and we're fixed up. We are supposed to be in the southeast on 8th. That's a Friday. Which Enugu is the normal place where the southeast have met, uh, we meet for their issues. But we have to change it. We couldn't go, uh, we couldn't change it and go to that place. Why? Why? Because of uh, one is, you don't have access, access road, access to Enugu. Or you couldn't fly? Or you, you, Which you, a fly? Other people are not going to come to Enugu from other parts of the southeast. Well, you can fly to Enugu, you know, but will all the other centers, all the people from uh, Abia, from Imo, from all the, uh, uh, come to Enugu? For, uh, from Onicha, from Onicha. Ask, uh, uh, we are doing this with Abogudi, uh, Igwa uh, uh, He said we prefer Owere than coming to Enugu because he, to come to Enugu is going to take him six hours. Let me ask, so all these uh, uh, problems of uh, this is, uh, the, the, then the insecurity, we have the, uh, the, the, uh, the issue of uh, the IPOB and, uh, and all, all that, the, the kind of uh, slag we had in, uh, Sorry, in uh, trying to give leadership Sorry, to our people I, I, there. I'll come back to you in a, show, in, in a moment. Uh, Mr. Wanko, uh, as a lawyer, a senior lawyer, that, I mean, you've helped, uh, you've been part of uh, constitutional, uh, the, the formulation of our constitution. And you understand. And recently, there is a formulation of the national core values, which is basically an extraction of our constitution. Participation is part of it. Do you agree with what the senator said? I think that across the country, uh, there seems to be a multitude, an aggregation of huge complaints from different parts of the country. Uh, yes, in some areas, uh, the complaints are defined in particular manners, but I haven't seen any part of this country that hasn't complained uh, about where things are. And when we celebrated 61 years of independence last week, uh, a lot of people would rather say to you, angry 61 years rather than happy 61. Uh, and I think that for a country where things are at where they are now, uh, there calls a need uh, for a major, major discussion about what is the anger of all of the country. Uh, the Southeast, of course, has its own peculiar issues. Uh, but when you look at violence, you know that it has never solved any problem. And when you look at uh, the manner in which people express themselves, you know it has never really solved any problem. And when I look at, I look back to history, recent history even, um, I can't tell you as we speak now who is responsible for the violence in the Southeast. Uh, I do know in the pro-democracy struggles that we all, uh, we, a lot of us went through, uh, how vicious that time was, how people were killed, how bombs were exploded on the streets. And we couldn't tell, for instance, who was exploding the bombs. Uh, of course, the narrative put out was it was Nadeko. But we couldn't tell who was exploding the bombs. It seems to me that there is a confluence of actors operating in the Southeast, orchestrating violence for different reasons. So when you tell me or you try to put out a particular narrative to say it's this segment, I don't totally buy the view that it is by any particular or one actor. There are several actors who are profiting, politicians, 
whatever, state, non-state actors, who really, really need to be called back from the precipice that the we are headed President has to. said in his October 1st speech that uh, a lawmaker is one of those who are sponsoring some of the agitations. I don't know. The president has uh, access to a lot of intelligence that um, he has. Uh, but again, I go back to the story about Nadeko being accused of all of the atrocities going on then. And we all knew later that it was sometimes not Nadeko. In fact, Nadeko was a nonviolent body. So when the president says something like that, it is worrying. Because for you to reach such a conclusion, is the president has to be very, very circumspect in saying some of these things. When you accuse a member of government, a policy maker of such serious violations of the law, it requires that you do more than say it. And I, 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 I really worry about the president uh, making such statements. I, I don't think it is appropriate. I think that, they, of course, the lawmakers in the House of Representatives did today say that they would like the president to be more specific. Uh, but I think that demonizing, for me, I worry about demonizing because when things are orchestrated to demonize, then the question is what is really going what on. What if it is, I mean, if the president says it, that is the commander-in-chief. He has the chief of all of the intelligence in this country. And when he says, this is a problem security-wise, shouldn't that be a cause for worry? Because he has all of the information. Yeah, that's what I and said. If, said, I, I if think someone it's is important. sponsoring, don't you think that he has all of the information? I think it's important that the, the president... Um, can say such things, he's will be backed by intelligence. Uh, but there are different, different issues across the country. Uh, the president has a lot of intelligence about what is going on all over the country. Some of that intelligence relates to the violence uh, and the terrorism going on in the Northeast, uh, in the Northwest, uh, in, the, in, the, in the North Central, uh, and across the country. And it seems to me that um, when the president is very eager to uh, point to a particular direction, uh, the office of president, quite frankly, is, is very elevated. And it seems to me very important that the president needs to be very measured in some of the things that he says, especially when a particular part of the country feels completely marginalized, uh, I wouldn't say disenfranchised, but completely marginalized in, in the present dispensation. I think there's a need for a lot of care. But, but the feeling and the reality are two different things. You might have a feeling, but in reality it might not be true. In your own view, is there a true picture of marginalization? I, I, I would leave that to the politicians uh, to, to speak about, but yes, I think that there is the perception that people have uh, of being marginalized. And I would tell you that it's spread across the country. So not, it's not exclusive to the Saudis. I, I think it's a question of the proportions of marginalization. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we come to the issue, issue of law because I know that you have uh, a lot of information that you keep, give us tonight. Let's look at the security dimension in all of this. Uh, Mr. Macri, give us a sense of what is meant. What you have seen and what you have heard, the attacks you're seeing on politicians, on, uh, um, by non-state actors, on on uh, facilities and institutions of government in the Southeast region. Would you say that's a result of agitation or criminality? Uh, thank you very much, Sean. You know, when we look at the present situation in the country, and then of course the security angle to it, you find out that there are fundamental issues uh, we might be addressing, there is a tendency for us to address uh, the symptoms, uh, but there are fundamental issues of unemployment, of um, uh, ethnic um, uh, agitations, religious agitations, you know, all kinds of fundamental things that go on. Uh, there is, most of the time, we don't want to address those fundamental issues. We prefer to either make noise or address those symptoms that we have 
in the society. Now, so when you look at it, what is going on right now, especially in the Southeast now, there are serious agitations when it comes to marginalization. And of course, when you say marginalization, it depends on how you are looking at it. Uh, certain statistics could tell you that, yes, if uh, Southeasterners feel that they are marginalized, um, in fact, somebody brought out a statistics recently that says that uh, most of the federal appointments, uh, the Northwest had 37, um, uh, Northeast had 29, um, North Central have 21. Uh, the Southwest has the bulk of appointments, which is 64. The Southeast has 15, which is the least. And then, of course, the South South, 24. So when you look at statistics like this, yes, somebody from Southeast might say, oh, we are marginalized. But you know that it is not by the appointment that the, you know, the area gets better. Uh, we've had in this country history where most of the people in the Federal Executive Council, or should I say the security architecture, like we used to mention now, were people from the Southeast. You know, so... It is something that sways and swings one way or the other. And then, of course, when we have um, all kinds of uh, non-state actors coming into play, and then, of course, um, changing the narrative, because when you start doing all that, um, yes, the president has a lot of uh, intelligence, and, of course, they will tell him, because it is not people coming to deny. Uh, with all the bunnies and the bombings, the... Southeast, IPOV has said no. But of course, the security agency is no better. Uh, even uh, one of your guests have said that uh, the, um, the violence that was going on during the Nadeko days was not that Nadeko. But the security agency is no better. You know, even in South Africa, when the uh, ANC I, I, was... I'd like, like, like to pick from what you've said and also make yeah. an inference from one of the interviews that uh, we've been playing on Channel's TV... Uh, the Senate Minority Leader, who said to us that there are about over 30 separatist groups as of now in the Southeast region. What do you make of that kind of situation? Well, people can uh, have all kinds of agitations. Maybe some of them are in the uh, closet. They've not come out. Uh, there are separatist groups all over the country. And that's what I'm looking at. If you have a holistic view of the country itself, you find out that it is not just the Southeast. In the Northeast, you have Boko Haram is a separatist group because they want to create a caliphate of their own. And then you go to the Northwest, you go to the Central, and then, of course, South-South, you know, these agitations are there. And if you have to enumerate them, I think there are a lot of them. And that's why we, we feel that the issue, particularly, is an issue of governance. Because when people feel that they are not part of the government, then they will start to agitate. Uh, even in, in states that are doing very well, uh, you find out pockets of agitations coming out and saying that... Um, oh, we are marginalized because uh, no road has come to our place and all those kind of things. So you, you get it in a country like Nigeria. Mr. Uh, Amakri, give us a sense. You are an expert in intelligence. That is the water that you have, uh, uh, you've operated for a long time before your retirement. For the kind of situation that is happening in the Southeast region, dissect it for us. We want to get a sense of what is really happening. We thought that things had gone down and things had simmered and there is a relative peace. But if you were in charge of intelligence or security of this country or that of the Southeast, how would you interpret what is happening? Or what would you say is at the heart of the, the violence that we're seeing? Uh, thank you very much, Sam. I think what we are seeing right now in the Southeast is two pronged. One, the people that are agitating or the non state actors that are trying to, you know, either create uh, terror, because that's what they are doing. They are creating terror, scaring people. 
you know, is that number one, there should be no election in the Southeast. They don't want that election to take place. And the second one is where national symbols of Nigeria are being destroyed. Flags are being burned. The Nigerian flag, which we hold all we all hold sacred, is being burned. And then, of course, some public buildings are being attacked. That also shows you that these two, uh, the meaning of what is going on is that some people don't want uh, either Nigeria or number two, they don't want election. You know, because, well, of course, if there's going to be a Biafra, then there should be no Nigerian election. And that was that is the agitation. Now, um, when you look at this, the agitators themselves are a minority because most of the people that are in the Southeast are not ready to go on this adventure with them. Although some people will come out and tell you, oh, we are marginalized. Yes, that is the song. That is the propaganda that will be used. We are marginalized. But of course, when things change, when the country the political scenery changes, then things will change again. Right now, many people are agitating, OK, yes, other uh, sections of the country have had the presidency and all the rest. It should come to the East. Now, if you want the presidency to come to the East, is this the way to get it? Because apparently, people will think that you're not ready to get it. But again, a, 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 a caution for this, everybody, is that the president, where the president come, does not necessarily mean that that place will be better than other places in the country. And we've looked at it. There are a series of presidents that we can look at and then, of course, make that inference. So these are the things that are playing out. And then, of course, um, INEC is very worried because we have said this months before now, that instead of addressing those fundamental issues, those root causes, the agitations, the unemployment, all the kinds of kidnapping, banditry, if we don't address those things, and of course the politicians, that's my problem again too, all right. because me, me, the politicians sometimes... Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Mercury, just a quick one, yes. before I bring the conversation back here in the studio. The governor says, uh, they said that they've abolished the sit-at-home order. Is that the right way to tackle the problem? Well, if you abolish the seat at home and it is still going on, that means that you have you don't have the power to enforce it. Because see, the the people they just that said it today that, that uh, they condemned yeah. it, and with the effect that the seat at home order is having on the economy and the livelihoods of the people in the region, they said it will no longer hold, and they have abolished it. So they make uh, they've made an official proclamation in that respect. But I'm asking, in terms of security and in the practicality of handling that kind of situation, is that a right handling? Uh, well, um, making statement, political statements are sometimes uh, misleading. But anyway, the army has sent in a contingent, a contingency down there to make sure that they assist the civil authorities in enforcing peace. So if the governor said that, OK, the sit-at-home order has been condemned, we don't want anybody to sit at home, come out again, the people that announced it earlier, we are enforcing it by going around and beating up people and stuff like that. So the military is there already on ground. And I believe strongly that they are going to make sure that, you know, the ban, oh, uh, you know, the, the, the stoppage, uh, stops and then, of course, people come out and then pursue their normal businesses. All right. Let me ask uh, Senator Utazi, why is it that a concept originated and being rolled out or dished out by non-state actors such as a sit-at-home order is taking such a huge effect in your region? What is causing it? Well, you see... Uh... Uh, there are a lot of uh, issues that led to that. You know, uh, when we started having the problem of uh, headers in our area, you know, it was not addressed the way we wanted 
that issue to be addressed. And uh, the federal government prevaricated. They were neither here nor not there. I face the headers and disarm these people that go with AK-47 and allow the farmers to be. That was not a forthcoming. And then, because of this vacuum created, there are, and there are many people are complaining. Then the IPOB saw a vacuum and moved into that vacuum, filled it. And they were actually trying to go into the forest, chase uh, the, uh, the herders that are killing uh, the farmers and making life unbearable for our people. So before you know it, they, have, they are meeting the needs of people. Is the le political leadership in your region lost control? No, why I want to say, you see, you know, just, uh, earlier when we started, we started, I started talking about uh, Simpson. You know, you talk about Machiavelli in his uh, book, The Praise. He said that at the onset, when issue is, a problem is coming, it is very difficult to identify the symptoms. But when he has blown up, and everyone knows it, then it becomes difficult to provide solution to. That's what will happen. But when these issues were Senator, coming, coming you are, you are up, it was government. not immediately, yes. You are part of government. You are part of the political leadership yes. in the Southeast. Yes. As the political leadership in the Southeast lost control, well, you see, I, I won't say that they lost control. But what I want to say is that oh, you are, time, you, time. Because you are part of it. So I'm saying time. You know, when you, you, you couldn't time properly and get things done properly, then when the, it gets out of hand, it becomes an issue. It was not properly handled when this matter came up. When people were shouting, uh, handled the issue of uh, headers and the farmers in the area, nobody listened. The governors are saying that some of the people who are propounding this and who are raising this issue are not even in the country. That are well, doing this via in the internet and social media. Well, today the world is a global village. But I want to tell you that... But are the, you aware that some of the proponents of these sit at home and these agitations and these uh, violence are not even in the country? And I want to tell you that, like I said, the world is a global village. People operate everywhere. And listen, we are here in Abuja talking. You are talking with somebody in Texas. So this is the world. Is that we the have situation today. in the South? That is the, 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 the situation in the South so and everywhere. What was the solution, but I Senator? To, the so, so, uh, solution was that the South is caucus in the National Assembly. We met about two weeks ago and addressed this issue. You know, that... Yes, we didn't feel in that a, a vacuum was uh, created there. It wasn't filled, and things are got, getting out of hand. And we started the, the discussion, you know, with the security agencies and all the non-state actors and uh, trying to reach out. We are on course. And that, it was after that, our discussion, that the sit at home, they are the, these, uh, the IPOP and their people uh, said that they were not going to continue with uh, sit, uh, sit at home on Mondays again. And all that. So we, well, at least we started there. But then, even in the southeast now, the, the uh, IPO people say that the sit at home is no longer working. Our people are still not forthcoming. Fear. But, uh, you see, the, this issue of fear is already in uh, the, 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 uh, we, there. We had a narrative that some of those who attack our people, innocent Nigerians, are probably from Libya, Sudan, and all of that. In the case of the southeast, do you know the people who are doing this violence? Well, if you ask me, she will ask you, I'll return the question to you. I'm, I don't live in the Southeast, <laughs> but you are representing people from the Southeast. Yes, I'm, I want are to tell you. Are these people aliens or they are people well, from... I want to tell you that when there is a situation, yeah. when there is trouble, so many people, you find so many people, non-state actors, so many people are grieved and use the opportunity to deal with people. You know, so it's, you cannot just say, come and say, it is IPOB. It is all that. So, but when there is a disorderly situation, the tendency that anything can cash in. And that's the situation in South today. Everybody, nobody, everybody is uh, afraid. Is everybody is of, bothered. Has it gotten is, out of hand or it can still be savage? It can be savage. That's what we have started. This discussion, you know, we started this, uh, the Southeast Caucus, in the National Assembly, we started this. Part of uh, a follow-up is this meeting they had in Enugu today. You know, and we are continuing. We are also going to enlarge it and reach out to other uh, major stakeholders because in the South to the, look at this issue. Yeah, to if you see these social media videos, you will see these young people shooting sporadically, and they do that for several minutes on the streets. In, in a way, you see the videos of uh, some of these young people, and they're going from place to place, shooting sporadically. It does look like this, some, of, some of these people may be living, uh, living in, uh, within the, uh, amongst the people. 
And the question is that, are you able to talk to some of them? Are you able to reach out to them? No, the issue is that, like I said, we have started. No, but Senator, yes. you've said that. We earlier. have started but the this question, uh, issue Senator, of how to sort this out. No, no, but are you able to reach out to them? Because we are looking for solution. And right, this is an avenue to seek the solution. Are you able to reach out to them? Well, we are reaching out to them because the issue is that is a, a consequence of such a reach out that we started this discussion that led to these people say that no more sit, uh, sit at home on Mondays again. So they are listening to the They are listening. They are, they, if you follow the social media, you can see their response that some people are coming to even listen to them and see uh, and have a feedback from them and know how we can... Uh, uh, ameliorate the situation and get things done. But ultimately, what do you think is the principal solution? One thing that can be like a magic wand that can erase all of this problem from the Southeast region. Well, I want to tell you that Mr. President has the magic wand. One is that his attitude, his language to the Southeast, he has to change it. If it's, it means that he won't be speaking as temporary, that they are going to write speeches for him to do that, let him do that. It's very, very important. The temperature is high. He has to come, the, the way he talks down on our people, and the way, it's not, it's not good. Would a, an equal presidency in 2023 resolve the problem? <laughs> well, I've, I've said the times, times that number, that uh, changing the, uh, 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 with a red cap does not address the issue. The issue you have, there are fundamental things you need to address. And pres the president, one of it is that the president needs to address the issue. He has to, he has to come out and address okay. the in the language, the, uh, not the, uh, the way they, they said, understand. they understand. You know, that, not, not in not Igbo that, language. Not, 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 not that in Igbo language, because I'm not sure it speaks Igbo. <laughs> but in the language, you, you, <laughs> you has appreciate. A president, you see, if you are in charge of a, a place and you are uh, managing, your attitude, your body language, we convey a lot of meaning to people that you, these are your people, All right. that you are in charge of them. So he has a, to find a way of reaching out the stakeholders in the Southeast, talking to, with them, and making sure that all these people are brought on board. And then we we'll look at the issues let's, that are being addressed by let, the Southeast. Let, let's again. And you give answers to them. Yep. It's not just a question of a tokenism. It doesn't work. We, okay. we, we are involved. We are we, we involved majorly in this, in, in this country. And I'll tell you, a stable Nigeria is the best for the Igbos. Because we're everywhere. We are trying to, there's no part of the country that makes Nigeria home like the Igbos. So when you see the same people who are doing all that, who are cosmopolitan, moving everywhere, all of a sudden things are working that they, something is wrong. So let us get down to the issue, not the symptoms. Get down to the root cause and get things done. If we, if the Mr. President will devote time and look at this, I tell you, all these things will just end. Mm. Uh, Mr. Mwanko, let, let, give us your legal uh, expertise here again. If they say the, the reason, the psychological reasons for this is that they don't want an election, for a number of states, constitutionally speaking or legally speaking, what is the implication if there is no election on 11th of November? I'll speak to that, but I, I, I think it's important to also make the point that, um, yes, the president has a wand. The political leaders of the Southeast also have their own magic wand. And I think that as someone from the Southeast, I feel very, very disappointed with the political leadership of the Southeast. I think the politicians in the Southeast have been a huge, huge uh, disappointment to the people who elected them. Um, if you go to a lot of the major cities in the Southeast, Aba, for instance, it's such a disgrace. Onisha, it's such a disgrace. Yes, the major roads are bad. Enugu, Onisha, Enugu, Port Harcourt. Some states have had to repair federal roads and go back with the bill to say to the president, can you pay us the bill? Coming from the Southeast, I think it's such a shame to have some of those who are governors in the Southeast. A lot of them are more interested in positioning for 2023 rather than governing in the period they've been elected for. So I think a lot of the anger is also against those who have been elected by the people in the Southeast. That's why people are angry, not just about the president who is in Abuja, but about those who are sitting in state capitals. 
even of our legislators. Because a lot of some, some people have, there is a school of thought that say, you are even blaming someone who is far away from you, who, who is not even your blame. Yes, the president has his own yeah. faults and challenges. In all of and this, a lot of us feel that he is not given equal uh, uh, resources or uh, marginalizing the Southeast. That, that's the perception widely seen in the Southeast. And so you see a lot of that reaction. Uh, but a lot of reactions also go to Imo State. For instance, I come from Imo State. A lot of the anger in Imo State is not about the president in Abuja. A lot of the anger in Abia State is not about the president in Abuja. A lot of the governors are huge, huge disappointment. You are meeting in the Southeast. The whole lot of conversations around how do you protect your citizens? What have the governors done? They talked about the Bubagu more than a year ago. What have they done? How have they protected their citizens? But coming back to the election issue, I, I think that constitutionally, there is the threat of a constitutional crisis. Um, Section 26 allows for INEC to postpone elections where there is breach of peace, likelihood of breach of peace, or even emergencies. Uh, and I think that INEC and if you listen to the chairman of the commission, thinking aloud and speaking aloud, he's saying, I mean, I have, I have children. If they are about to do their youth service, I would really want them to contribute to national service. But I'm also concerned that having trained them in school for so long, I don't want to lose them working as assistant presiding officers or INEC or ad hoc officials. So I would be concerned about that. Now, if you don't hold elections, Within 30 days and 150 days, there is a constitutional crisis that sets in. And how then do you deal with it? You postpone elections. To what extent can you postpone elections? The, election, the, the, the constitution also gives the president powers to declare a state of emergency. In that case, if there's a state of emergency declared, it actually means that the incumbent governor could have his tenure extended constitutionally under these powers of emergency that is created in the Constitution where elections cannot hold. I believe that those, and I have said it before, and I say it again, that as a confluence of actors, not just those who are aggrieved, but a confluence of actors from different sides who are interested in ensuring elections do not hold. Uh, and for those who are civil actors, who are from whatever uh, um, unit it is, whether it is even IPOB, it is not in the interest of citizens in the Southeast that elections do not hold. It is also not in the interest of citizens from the Southeast that you lock down the Southeast, or whether it's on a Monday or whatever day, to protest. These issues are inimical to the economic growth of the Southeast. And one we wonder, uh, also, which, of course, in, in the final analysis uh, and in the closing uh, thoughts of uh, the panel tonight, because the question is that whatever the grievance is, does, could that be the reason for killing your own people? Because if these uh, uh, agitations or this violence is being done in the Southeast, um, assumed that it's being done by people of the Southeast extraction, and people of the Southeast are the ones that are being killed, does that make sense, Senator? It doesn't make any sense. It's madness. You see, and uh, the whole thing is that uh, things have deteriorated. And then you see people who have any issue, one, 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 one issue or the other with anybody, to take advantage of the situation and, you know, visit mayhem on people. That is the situation. Because, the, Senator, you know, because the, the see, big question is that these people are not aliens. They are known. They, they, are, not, they are not faceless. I'll they are not unknown gunmen. They are actually known gunmen in the area. So the question is that, why are they not being fished out? That's people what, that's, that's what that's the, that the intelligence, that is, that is the problem of intelligence. We really want our inter, uh, the intelligence community, I mean, the, the, the SSS that are concerned, the police, you know, the DMI, to actually look into the situation there. You know, they have the means, they have the, the, uh, the technological uh, uh, but, know but you, As a political leader, done. you should be able to point the f them to those people. How can you know? Because you are speaking to them. Yes, the, what I'm saying is that we are talking generally 
uh, anybody who is concerned, who feels he has, he has a disaffection, or not, please, down to, right. don't get things done. We are not, it's not that I'm talking particularly that you know that this one is in this house, you go to his house and say, it is you, or uh, on the main road, you we, say it is this person. We, no, that's we, not the issue. We need to so close we, yeah. Yeah, so we are, are asking the security agencies to uh, step up. We know the problems that, caused, that uh, came uh, after this, uh, uh, the answers. The security agencies are not as forthcoming as they used to be. All right. Senator, uh, Ms. Mr. Wonko, what is the solution? It's really about the election, because you are an expert in that area. I think that elections need to hold. I think that those who are aggrieved about politics in this country, uh, who feel very marginalized, and that includes a lot of us, uh, need to understand that the best way of changing things would be by ensuring that the ballot takes place. For Anambra State, I think elections need to hold. Uh, I do not support a separate Biafran country, and I think a lot of us, and the Senator has made the point very clearly, that the people of the Southeast would benefit tremendously from a peaceful, just and equitable Nigeria. And I think that what we need to walk is to walk towards that direction. An election is one tool towards achieving that. All right. Um, so let's close the program by getting Mr. Macri's uh, view. Uh, Mr. Macri, I'll put you right on the spot and I'll give a very difficult job just in about 40 seconds. And the job is this. If I were the president, for example, and I want to consult you, or the nation is consulting you as a security consultant to find solution to the problem that is happening in the Southeast, what would be your solution? Uh, thank you very much. Um, this uh, problem is not one that will just have a swing of uh, a magic wand. Uh, to solve. I think uh, the president is listening to the security agencies and all the intelligence uh, community. And I think uh, they are already on it because definitely the security uh, people are on top of this issue and they will solve it because uh, with the military in there and the SSS and the police, all have been in series of strategic meetings that they've been having. I think they will handle it properly. But um, one thing all is right. that people also should get involved, not only the security agencies, everybody. All right. We're going to end, we're going to close the program in a unique way. And since we have you as a politician, they elected you into office, they listen to you. We see you as a figure, a political figure, representing the people of the Southeast. I'll just give you 20 seconds. If you can just look into that camera, Senator, and speak to your people and tell them that they should stop killing themselves and they should stop this madness and criminality, some of those who are perpetrating it. What would you say to them now, Senator? I want to tell the Southeasterners that they are grieved, that they feel disenchanted, they feel dis uh, uh, disoriented, they feel that they are not part and parcel because of marginalization. To know that they are taking uh, the way of violence is not a way to solve any problem. It is always better when we can come to the table and dialogue. And there's an opportunity for that, you know, to get things done. And uh, uh, if we still work very hard, uh, where we have uh, challenges in terms of leadership and all that, that uh, is giving us a lot of trouble. 2023 is around the corner. Get better hands. You know, leadership recruitment are the, are, the, are, the, are the heart of what we are doing right. to get those, uh, uh, the right kind of people to put in place to make sure that things work for better for our people. I'm just concerned about the solution, and I do not want lives to be lost again. If I, if I had the opportunity, I would have asked you to speak in Igbo language, but we don't have that kind of uh, that would be opportunity. For another time. Thank you so much, Senator Utazi, for coming tonight. Mr. Clement Huanko, it's only a pleasure to have you talk to us. Thank you so much for your time. You. And Mr. Dennis Amakri, thank you for the expertise that you have given us for free. We appreciate it. We don't take it for granted. Thank you so much, my partner tonight. It's a pleasure having you to give perspective to these issues. But that's how we end the show today. Thank you so much for watching, everyone. My name is Shoa Kimale. Have a wonderful evening.